Of all the directions to take a game in which your main mode of traversal is parkour, throwing you into an environment where the parkour is suddenly not your best way of getting around could have been disastrous. Spoilers, it wasn't. It's fun as hell. Seriously, this shouldn't have worked as well as it did, but driving around the countryside is actually really nice, and while I don't personally care for the amount of back and forth you need to do, there's a way to do these things to minimise your frustration with it. I'm reminded somewhat of A House of Many Doors, a game very similar to Sunless Sea, in which you travel through an eldritch realm and start to move in big circles to maximise your trade and quest logging, at least if you aren't on a specific chain. That isn't to say parkour is totally abandoned, however, as there's various locations dotted around the map that require your climbing abilities to surmount, including the local town which is filled with screamers because the game wants to give you heart palpitations. In contrast to the city where hunting bolters was done under the cover of night, the green boys feel safer out in the open fields during the day, and you get to run them over with your car because chasing them on foot is just as inadvisable as it is in the city, but they don't have as many obstacles to slow them down, so roadkill it is. Where taking down a volatile nest was a major story step you did once during the main game, in the following it becomes part of the map completion where you venture into them at night when all the volatiles are out hunting and clear it before dawn, which always comes faster than it ever would if you were outside the nest because again, heart palpitations. As much as I genuinely enjoy the story for what it is, I don't care for it being gated behind a progress bar that you need to fill by doing side content. I've never found that engaging, and more often than not, it ends up working in funny, immersion-breaking ways if you've been doing more side content than the devs maybe expected you to. The most egregious example of this that comes to mind is in Far Cry 5, where every time you fill the progress bar enough, the story decides to literally come and get you, having you kidnapped in a variety of ways, such as getting shot by a drugged bullet, shot in the thigh with an arrow, or inexplicably snuck up on by a lady in a lace dress and getting more drugs blown in your face. Seriously, I do love Far Cry 5 for all its flaws, but that aspect was really dumb. But that aside, let's get on with the story of the following, shall we? If you enjoy this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe, and drop a comment telling me your experience with the game. Our story begins with a quote from the 1994 movie of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, just so you're aware right away that the story is trying to tell you something about its themes, but let's not worry about that too much right now. The introductory cutscene shows Lena tending to an injured and delirious man who, through his rambling, informs Crane that there's not only a way out of Haran, but a place where some kind of magic or mysticism has rendered the people safe from infection, even when they're bitten. The man carried a marked map showing the way out, and Lena stresses to Crane that they're running out of Anderson and need to explore every possibility, no matter how far-fetched. It seems, even with Camden working on a cure, things are increasingly dire in Haran, implying some GRE meddling to try and twist Crane's arm. This is interspersed with flashes of sun imagery and the people Crane has lost since arriving in the city, and he resolves to find the way out and whatever it is that's protecting those people from turning in order to save what remains of his friends. Just before he leaves, the injured man warns him to stay away and tries to say something about the mother, only to handily pass out before he can give away the surprise. I mean, what? What surprise? It's nothing. Don't worry about it. Anyway. Travelling through the sewers, Crane eventually drops into a cave system and emerges into the sunny countryside. He calls Lena to tell her that he made it out and shortly after loses contact because mountains are jerks, but not before she lets him know that the injured man is dead now. <coughs> Making his way to a nearby farm, Crane is briefly accosted by a guard, but is directed by the untrusting locals to their leader, called Jasir. Crane finds him arguing with his angry goth lesbian of a daughter, Ezgi, and if you disagree with that descriptor, what straight woman would risk life and limb, on foot no less, putting herself in danger of being ripped apart, eaten alive, and turned into a flesh-eating monster, all because she and her friend want to live their own lives together, defensively grabbing her friend's hand while she justifies herself? There is no heterosexual explanation for this, and yes, I do pretend they both got out alive. Thank you for asking. In the arms of the angel. But back to the actual story, Jasir tries to brush off Crane at first, believing he's just looking for food, but when Crane brings up the supposed immunity of the locals, he grows even more standoffish, telling him to take some bread and go back to Haran because no one wants him here. Unwilling to leave without help for his friends, however, Crane talks to a smuggler called Khan, who firmly doesn't believe in the locals' religious customs, openly calling them nut jobs, but is allowed to exist with his face intact because he brings them much-needed supplies. He explains that the locals are in a cult led by a woman called the Mother, something that used to be a nearly forgotten tradition that became inescapable under the stress of the outbreak. At Crane's prompting, Khan mentions that he doesn't recall any of them actually turning, so there might be something behind the claims of immunity after all. 
We find out that the delirious man was a friend of Khan's and down an accomplice, he sets Crane up with a buggy, willing to give him more information about how the locals protect themselves if Crane does some work for him. I'm sure this can't go wrong. Oh, forgot to tell you. If you ain't got none, find yourself some weapons. The farm's a bandit outpost. Wait, what? You, you forgot to tell me this? Well, they weren't important at the moment. Off to a great start, Khan. Thanks. Regardless, Crane gets some wheels and comes back to Khan's trailer only to find Esgi instead. She tells him Khan was asked to leave by a mysterious they, and expresses just as much disdain and mistrust of Crane as everyone else. But at Crane's insistence on a way to prove that he isn't just another stranger out for himself, Esgi points him in the direction of the water pumping station. She expects a favour in return at some point in the future, which Crane agrees to. This turns out to be getting her to the city with her definitely heterosexual friend. Heading out to the station, Crane kicks in the teeth of some water-extorting bandits and finds a local man held captive by them called Ali. He gets the pumps running, only a problem with a closed valve somewhere in the system causes a dangerous build-up of pressure, prompting Crane to frantically drive along the pipes as they start to give under the strain. He finds the offending valve just in time to avoid drowning and restores water to the locals. Jasir is thankful, and Crane asks again what keeps his people safe. More willing to listen now, Jasir explains that their prayers and faith in the mother is what keeps them safe. Crane is of course sceptical, but with no other options he resolves to do the work necessary to earn an audience with the mother and her servants, the Faceless. This at least gives a narrative purpose to the story gating, but you could just as easily structure the story in such a way that it flows naturally from one major problem solved to the next religious meeting and so on. As he heads out to meet with a man named Bilal at a gas station outside of town, he calls Lena to check in. Everyone back home is worried, but Lena seems to be keeping it together. After meeting with Bilal and his brother Nori, Crane heads off to help Ali at the dam in the far south of the map and gets to witness exactly how the Faceless keep zombies at bay. Which seems less like magic and more to do with whatever he's burning, but ritualizing it plays an important role. Sometimes it's easier to put your trust in something like a local belief system you grew up with, rather than stripping it down to its crude components. Ali is a little grumpy that Bilal didn't trust him to fix things properly, and puts Crane to work turning things on inside the dam, which nearly gets him killed when he runs face first into a demolisher, but it's fine. The priest warns Ali that they're running out of time, and Crane eventually finds his way back to them through an outlet pipe, finding the priest dead, the cloud of blue smoke gone, and Ali hidden in one of the containers. Without the priest to keep the zombies at bay, Crane fights them off instead while Ali finishes his work, getting the power back up and running, for now. The Faceless recognize Crane's efforts and encourage him to continue serving the needs of the people, handing him a crossbow as recognition, which is a hell of a lot easier to aim than a bow in this game, which I hate because I love to use bows whenever possible, but the bows are ass! Heading back out, Crane scurries around helping people with a variety of tasks, finding out the fate of missing loved ones, rescuing people, bringing medicinal herbs that they need, setting up new safe zones, taking out dangerous infected, clearing nests, and generally just making life easier for everyone. One such mission involves going into town and retrieving a package for a child from his mother, who is presumed dead in Haran along with a handful of letters for adults, one of which he reads for them because his wife was the one who did that and she isn't around anymore and all of which serve to make things feel normal again, just for a little moment. <clears throat> anyway. Crane is eventually summoned by the Faceless to a cultural landmark in the mountains, where the statue of an ancient sun god looks out over the valley from a place called the Eye of the Sun. He attends a gathering where people are praying to the mother and finds Khan there, who seems to have been brainwashed, but we'll see about that, won't we? The priests come out with sensors that give off the same blue smoke from before, keeping the zombies on stage with them docile as they call for the mother to come out. She does, but stays at a distance, dressed in blood red and gold robes with a mask that hides her face. I'm sure she looks totally normal under there, nothing to hide, don't worry about it. The priests descend, and one gives Crane a solid dose of the weird smoke before pulling him on stage, whereupon he hears the mother's voice in his head telling him that their destinies are intertwined and to believe in her as she believes in him. He passes out, and when he wakes up, a priest explains to him that he is currently protected from infection, so long as he stays on the right path. He promptly contacts Lena to tell her that he's immune for the moment, only to lose the call. After fixing the water again and finding out that what remains of Rise's men have scurried into the countryside to make life difficult for everyone, Crane investigates a strange blue cloud in the fields. He makes friends with a passive demolisher, murders it in cold blood, and then reports back to the Faceless that what he found was a destroyed convoy and an empty military-looking crate filled with broken glass. 
He's called back to Jazir's farm to speak in private, and the priest acknowledges that it's the smoke that keeps the zombies at bay, not any actual mysticism. The Children of the Sun are working on a more permanent solution, but they're running out of the elixir they use to keep things peaceful for now. The Faceless directs him to a nondescript cave to find more of the elixir, and Crane calls Lena on the way to keep her informed, only to be told that the tower has officially run out of Antizin. His friends are nearly out of time. In the cave, Crane finds a cloud of blue smoke, zombified bandits, soldiers, and another wrecked convoy. A radio inside a trailer remarks that the goods are undamaged, but not much else, so someone has already taken what was there. Crane warns the Faceless that Rise's men are about, and that they're more dangerous than disorganized bandits, not that it'll amount to much. With nothing else going on, the Faceless ask him to check on a man called Attila, who is working on something for the mother at her old home, an academic project analysing a prophecy involving ultimate sacrifice in the embrace of a light, stepping through the doors of death to bring life. This involves running around looking at painted pillars and climbing up to an ancient temple site where Crane retrieves a red mask, bringing it back to Attila so he can complete his studies in peace. Which would all be fine, if Crane wasn't later asked by the Faceless what Attila is up to because the man hasn't said a word to them since, and when he goes to check, Oh god damn it. <clears throat> Crane finds a letter from Attila that explains that he has a better solution than what the mother had him working on, and we learn that she was once a woman called Jasmine, the wife of a local colonel. Said colonel gave Attila a long numerical code to give Jasmine if her mind was sound, but the mother refuses to see him personally, so he entrusts Crane with it instead. There is no other option for me. I have to leave what the colonel gave me in your hands, Kyle. I know that when the time comes, you will make the right decision. Yeah, about that. Taking the mask and the book Attila was writing for the children to Jasir, Crane is promptly asked to liberate the local granary from Rise's men and rescue a priest called Brother Orkin, who you can find. Uh... <laughs> Holy fuck. Orkin. Jesus. Orkin insists he didn't talk and confirms that some of the elixir remains in a box that the thugs couldn't get open. He warns Crane that the mother is in danger and uses his last breath to point Crane towards the lighthouse. The Faceless tell Crane to head there and take any vials he retrieves directly to the mother at the dam. Eventually finding his way up the lighthouse, god damn it, I hate this structure, Crane runs into Khan of all people and discovers he's the one in charge of Ryza's remnants, the ones who have been poisoning the water and stealing the elixir. Khan tries to feign ignorance, but a call from his men gives him away, and the lighthouse is promptly blown to hell by RPG fire, sending it crashing to the ground. Khan dies in the fall, and Crane snatches three vials, booking it to the dam. He heads inside and finds a lot of dead faceless and remnant forces, walking through the bloody, mist-filled halls, calling out for anyone still alive. He hears the mother's voice again, lamenting all the fighting and death, and that she can't let it happen again. Crane is alarmed, hearing her voice in his head, and asks what's going on. She explains that the Children of the Sun were nothing before the outbreak, and that she's held the title of mother for too long, and that the weight of it during this crisis has exhausted her. She confirms that she was Jasmine, the colonel's wife. When the outbreak began, he came to get her to safety, only they were caught out and bitten, and he bled to death in her arms. Just before he died, however, he gave her a cigarette case. Jasmine was promptly dragged away by the believers who wanted to protect their mother from harm, even though she was already bitten herself. Crane enters a large chamber where he sees hallucinations of Jasmine and her guards searching the dam for supplies and safety. Because it turns out her husband didn't smoke, and the case contained a map, a key, and a note with numbers that led them to the dam. While healthier guards went to turn the power on, the rest of them looked for medicine, and they found a box containing the elixir. Trusting that her husband hadn't sent her here with a malicious intent and feeling that she was about to turn, Jasmine drank the elixir and remembers tasting blood. I awoke, down there, surrounded by the remains of the people who had trusted me. It was because of the light. Someone finally turned the power back on, and the light brought me back. You see? Breathing the fumes is one thing, but drinking the liquid is something else entirely. In the light, in the sun, my mind is my own. I'm filled with love you couldn't possibly imagine. But in the dark, my new nature dominates. Mindless, lethal. 
In the dark, with cruel passion, I ripped my own children to pieces. But I swore to myself that I would become the mother they really deserve. It turns out the mother is a sentient, telepathic volatile thanks to drinking the elixir, but only so long as she remains under UV, be it sunlight or artificial, because in darkness she becomes every bit the monster she looks. Crane tries to insist that he just needs the elixir to save his friends, and the mother commands him to look at her face and accept that there is no cure. Even the mist will eventually transform those who breathe it, and it's at this point the player is given a choice. Use the code given to them by Attila to nuke the region and hopefully wipe out the virus, or... This quote from the beginning stands out to me here, because in taking the other option, where Crane chooses to believe against reason that the elixir can help his friends, he becomes a desperate monster of tragedy. Crane has spent almost his entire time in Haran, helping people as best he can, going out of his way on ludicrously dangerous missions to make their lives easier. He is the kind of man who will risk his life just to make a child happy by bringing them a present from their dead mother. The concept of murdering all those people after fighting to keep them safe and swearing to Lena that he would come back with a solution is unbearable. So he rejects it. Enraged, the mother forces him to drink the elixir to show him what kind of solution it really is, and engages him in a surreal fight as the transformation takes hold, causing Crane to drop his weapons and fight her like a volatile would. He eventually rips her head off, but not before she tells him that he's going to kill all his friends. Exhausted and delirious, Crane stumbles away from the fight with the vials, hallucinating the mother's voice and growing increasingly desperate. I killed you. I fucking killed you! It's not a poison. It's a cure. He tries to get in touch with Lena, but no one answers, and he stumbles on, rambling that Camden has all the time in the world now. Finally reaching the surface, Crane emerges into the light of a setting sun, and finds himself outside the quarantine. Cars are driving by, public transportation is working, and a mother is playing with her children at the park. The children scream at his appearance, and when he reaches out to calm them, Crane is confronted with the reality he couldn't bear. In his denial and desperation for a way to save his friends, he has become the spark that will light the world on fire. enough melodrama. As I said in the last video, I enjoyed revisiting this game, and I still enjoyed its story for what it was. The gameplay is definitely much stronger than the writing and is a ton of fun, so I highly recommend it on that value alone. I don't recommend getting the sequel just yet, I've heard there's a lot of bugs right now, and to be perfectly honest, the first game has benefited a lot over the years from devs constantly filling its many holes. Hey, phrase it! For now, I'll move on to something hopefully less stressful to work on, so I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching, and if you have a game you'd like me to cover, please let me know in the comments. Have a lovely day.